Hi, everyone. We'll be with you in just a moment. Hi, welcome to the webinar Wisdom Study, Working to End Confusion About Receiving Mammograms. I'm Deb Hackenberry, Program Project Manager at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that's been helping people through breast metastatic, ovarian, and uterine cancer for the last 45 years by offering the support of those who've been there. SHARE provides many services, including a helpline, support groups, and educational programs. All services are free of charge to participants. For more information, please go to our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When the presenters finish presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. The chat section will be disabled. When asking questions, please remember the presenter is unable to give specific medical advice. So keep your questions general in nature. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Laura Esserman is Professor of Surgery and Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco, U UCSF, and Director of the UCSF breast, can breast Care Clinic. Her work in breast cancer spans the spectrum from basic science to public policy issues and the impact of both on the delivery of clinical care. Dr. Esserman is recognized as a thought leader in cancer screening and overdiagnosis, as well as innovative clinical trial design. She led the creation of the University of California-wide Athena Breast Health Network, a learning system designed to integrate clinical care and research as it follows 1, 150,000 women from screening through treatment and outcomes. The Athena Network launched the PCORI funded wisdom study, which tests a personalized approach to breast cancer screening in 100,000 women. She is also a leader of the innovative iSpy trial model designed to accelerate the identification and approval of effective new agents for women with high risk breast cancers. In 2020, she got FDA approval for an iSpy COVID trial designed to rapidly screen and confirm high impact treatments to reduce mortality and time on ventilators. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Esterman. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I'm just, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'm really excited to present the work that we're doing. And I know that many of you who are attending may yourselves have experienced breast cancer, so may not be eligible for the wisdom stu study, but I would bet that you know lots of people who have it and who are eligible to participate. And I wanna tell you, um, you know, about this study because I think, it's, uh, I think it's a high time that we had a modern era trial that helped us change our approach to screening. We've been screening the same way for about 40 years you know, long before uh, screening started, long before we even knew that there was estrogen positive breast cancer. So that's really what I'm gonna talk to you about today. And this is really uh, an effort for women really. And we're reaching out directly to women to join and participate as, in, you know, all of the major changes in, in cancer breast cancer really have come from women themselves stepping forward and participating in these trials that really sort of move us in a different direction in a better direction. And uh, I'm gonna take the time to explain that to you uh, over the course of this morning. I thought that what I would start with uh, to begin is uh, we're being featured this month in Time Magazine. Um, and they did such a really, such a great job uh, on, on their opening video that uh, I thought it'd be fun to share that with you. Uh, this morning. So let's start off with that. And um, I'm going to get that started right now. Take a couple minutes for that. And here we go. I had never really thought I was high risk for breast cancer. I don't have any family lineage or history of breast cancer, but I tested positive for a genetic mutation, which made me higher risk. 
They recommended I had an MRI, which did show that I had a small mass. It was malignant. That was the process in which I found out I actually had breast cancer. And I would have never gotten an MRI if it hadn't been recommended to me. I've always had this vision of the right treatment at the right time for the right person. Not every woman has the same risk. Maybe your risk is high enough that you should screen every six months or use contrast imaging in between mammograms. And then you don't want to torture the people who don't have that risk, doing a bunch of screening and biopsies and extra things that they don't need. So when you put those things together, does it really make sense to have a one-size-fits-all screening approach? I really call black breast cancer a different disease because the mortality numbers are devastating. We believe that there is going to be this profile that helps us understand who's at risk. Whether you're African American or you're Asian or you're Latina, that profile is probably different. We need more research, we need more data, we need more women of color in the studies so that we can eradicate breast cancer. The wisdom study is the beginning of a change in screening. And I think people take it very personally, but I'm not criticizing screening, I'm trying to make it better. Elias Sirhune, the former NIH director, actually said, you know, the greatest risk in medicine is to stop taking risks. And that you have to be willing to let go of the rung to which you are clinging if you want to get to the next rung. So that is, um, we'll go back to our regularly scheduled webinar. Okay, so that's just a little taste of what we're trying to do with the wisdom study. And I'll go to a little more detail. So screening when we first thought about it, you know, was based on this idea that if you were detected in later stages of disease, especially if it was stage four, or metastatic, you did very poorly. Whereas if you were detected at stage one, you did much better. And with screening, we found even earlier cancers like ductal carcinoma and psych 2. So the idea was, gosh, if we just could figure out how to get that earlier, we would eliminate most of the deaths from breast cancer. It was a good idea. And in other conditions like cervical cancer, that largely is true. But when you look back at it, part of the reason is because cervical cancer is a much more homogeneous disease. What that means is most of the cancers are more similar. They arise from a more similar reason and they're slow growing. But it turns out they're just different types of breast cancer and we didn't appreciate that. And so what you always have to do in medicine or science or anything you do, right? You launch something, you look at it, and then you say, well, what have I learned here? And what we've learned is that there are different rates at which tumors grow. We know that there's hormone positive tumors and hormone positive tumors span a huge spectrum from really slow growing indolent cancers, right? Until uh, to those that actually are, can be very rapidly growing and actually behave much more like basal cancers, like triple negative cancers. We did not appreciate this. But in this graph, we look at, this is the whole paradigm for screening. You can detect something when it's microscopic, when it's localized just to the breast, or when there's regional spread, when it's gone to the lymph nodes, or when it's already gotten to um, another part of the body. Now, in a very fast growing cancer, you can see that periodic screening, these kind of vertical lines, for something that's growing fast, you can't ask screening to do what it's not able to do. I mean, you might get lucky and have just catch it here, but for the most part, these fast growing cancers, the cat's out of the bag by the time you find them. And there, the important thing to do is to really think about better treatments and to better understand the biology and think about who's at risk and how to prevent it. These moderately growing cancers, here's where early detection is gonna make the biggest difference. 
But some of these very slow growing cancers that over someone's lifetime either may never come to clinical attention or aren't gonna kill you, you have to be careful that you don't over treat it when you find it and that you can recognize that biology when it starts. That's really what all of these molecular tools are about, the Oncotype, the Mammaprints and all of this, um, the PAM50s, all of this helps us to understand these different types of tumors. So surely this is you know, potential for harm. This is your maximum benefit. And here it's just ineffective. So surely screening should be adjusted to reflect our new understanding of breast cancer biology. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with these years of controversy and conflict about screening. And by the way, the data on screening was generated 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And most of the arguments are about the data that was generated decades ago. This does not help us get better. You can see the US Preventive Task Force, um, which most of the internal medicine folks who are ordering your mammograms agree with that most screening should start every other year starting at 50. This is opposed by the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging that says that all screening should start at age 40 and every year um, you know, until you have only five years of life expectancy. And then you've got the American Cancer Society, NCCN, ACOG, ACP, all these people, American College of Physicians, all in the middle, or they'll say, oh, share decision-making, go talk to your physician about it. And your physicians are like, oh my God, I don't want to wade into this because I have 30 minutes or 15 minutes and this isn't, this is, I don't, you know, anyway. Or they say, oh, if you're higher risk, but do we have tools to automatically do risk assessment in breast cancer? We do not. Could we? We could. And that is what the wisdom study is all about. So why change? Why change? Because the bottom line is that today in the US alone, over 40,000 women a year are still dying of breast cancer, despite screening every year. Over half of the stage two, three breast cancers present as palpable masses. I, in the iSpy trial, this other trial that I run, this is one of the things that really got my attention. You know, we used to blame women when they'd come in like, oh, you've got a big cancer. Oh, you didn't go in. You didn't, you're going to either blame some physician for not picking it up or the patient for not coming in earlier. But in truth, these are fast growing cancers. I run a prevention program. And one of the things I found is someone I'd saw seen six months ago came in with this nine centimeter cancer. I knew myself personally that it wasn't there. And it made me start thinking, oh, we've made a mistake in our thinking about these cancer because we didn't account for all these different types of cancer. So we need to think about how to change. And African-American women are more likely to die of their cancers than their white sisters, even though they're not more likely to get breast cancer. Another problem is that 75% of women who get biopsies don't have cancer. You can say, well, gosh, that's a relief but it can be really stressful to be a called back or to get a biopsy and it can cause a lot of anxiety and trauma. All fine if there's a real concern, but if you have extremely low risk and you're doing this every, there are some women who get called back every time they go in. Maybe we should know more about their risk. So clearly it's not that we have the solutions, but I think everyone can agree we can do better and we can apply what we've learned about breast cancer treatment to screening. So here's just a little tidbit here that I think is really important. And I want to elaborate on this a little bit. So these are the incidence rates. And you know, about 10 years ago, uh, the incidence rates were not as high in African-American women, but there's been a push to screen more, which has increased the, the incidence now. And so they're about equal for white and black women. But you'll see that the mortality rates are definitely higher. Now, what could be at the bottom of that? And and this actually explains why screening everyone and getting a variety of people in studies like this is so important for actually everyone. Is that, you know, if you look at the age, here's the age, and here's the percentage of breast cancers that are triple negative. These are the cancers that don't express estrogen receptors or progesterone receptors or HER2 markers. These are considered to be very aggressive cancers. So it turns out it's very uncommon to get breast cancer in your 20s very uncommon. But if you get it, at least a quarter of these cancers are going to be um, triple negative. Now, that turns out to be 
the same, whether you're white or black or Hispanic. But by the time you're 35 or 40, that rate plummets, right? And so maybe it's more like 10%. But for African-American women, they have this persistent risk of having triple negative cancers that's about 25%. Now that doesn't mean, now it turns out that African-American women are still more at risk for getting hormone positive breast cancer, but they have a higher risk for these earlier cancers. So it's not just them, but if you happen to be in this 10% of women who are at risk for a triple negative breast cancer, you should be treated differently than the woman who's at higher risk and differently from the African-American woman who's not at risk for triple negative breast cancer and the wider Hispanic or Asian woman who's not at risk. It, it turns out that you can get a bad cancer at any age and you can get a well-behaved cancer at any age, regardless of your race, regardless of your ethnicity. But there are things that you inherit that make you a little bit more predisposed to which. And it's time that we started seriously working on figuring out who's who so that we can help all women. And we know in the treatment space that the subtype of breast cancer that you have really affects the, you know, again, you see this, you know, big difference in the rates of triple negative breast cancer. But as I said, it doesn't mean other people aren't at risk for them. But if you have a triple negative breast cancer, it tells us the timing uh, for when you might have a recurrence. For triple negative breast cancers, all your risk is up front, first three years, essentially, three to five years. And once you've passed that five-year risk, you're, you're essentially done with your risk. Now, if you have a hormone positive breast cancer, your risk is just starting at five years and it's like 15 years. So there's the good and the bad of everything. But this tells us about what type of therapy will benefit, how much risk and when. And that should also probably tell us, are there these windows where someone's at risk? We not only have to start figuring out if they're at risk, when are they at risk? And what's the best way to think about not just screening, but more importantly, prevention. That's the holy grail. And that's important. So you might say, well, that's not possible. Well, think cardiology. When I started practice 30 years ago, it turned out that a woman was much, had a much higher risk of dying of heart disease than they did of breast cancer. Today, it's about even. And you might say, well, gosh, has the breast cancer risk gotten higher? The answer is no. The heart disease risk got lower. And how did that happen? Well, in the late 40s, some very smart person said, I'm gonna start a study called the Framingham study. And they systematically figured out who was at risk for heart disease. What were the risk factors for heart disease? And someone with this big vision said, okay, I'm gonna start systematically figuring out what those risk factors are. And then I'm gonna start figuring out what we can measure along the way to tell us about risk. like." blood pressure or cholesterol, which led to the development of drugs to lower blood pressure, dietary interventions, cholesterol drugs like statins. You know, statins have probably made the most amazing difference in reducing the risk of stroke and fatal heart attacks. Is it possible we could do that in breast cancer? A hundred percent. But I'll tell you, it will never happen if we don't systematically get around to figuring out who's at risk and for what type um, of, of, of breast cancer. And furthermore, if you think about it, who screens? We don't have a program where we invite everyone to screen. It, if you don't go to a primary care physician, you're not gonna get screened because someone, no one's really gonna ask you, or maybe you'll go to your local, maybe there's a mammography van in your area, maybe you'll go, go to it, but maybe you won't. So here's who's screening. We, somewhere between 50 and 70% of women now are being screened. And there's not that big a difference in the different ethnicities, right? So are the highest risk women being screened? Are the lowest risk women skipping screening? Have we informed those people? No, we haven't, it's just random. Is that really our best approach? Can we do better? Certainly. So who gets breast cancer? Well, it depends on your risk. Every woman has a different risk of developing breast cancer. And increasingly, our ability to forecast that risk has improved. We think that we can explain probably 70% of that risk. And the more work we do, the better we're gonna get at it. 
And what are the components? <clears throat> Your family history is still important, even in the setting of understanding genetics. We've learned so much more about genetics. And as I'll talk about before, there's lots of information, not just about the fairly uncommon rare mutations that confer risk, but all of the genes that you inherit. There are some that actually can confer together as a group, poly, many, genic risk, can confer a lot more risk. Your breast density, how dense that breast is, actually confers risk. Some of that's probably inherited, some of it's not, but regardless, and it has, some of it has to do with whether you take postmenopausal hormone replacement, et cetera, et cetera, your age, race, ethnicity, other things, lifestyle exposure, if you have children, whether you're breastfed, prior hormone therapy, all those things matter. <clears throat> and they can be put into models. And one of the models we use is the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium model, which actually has been validated on a million women across a fairly diverse risk. So we don't go to the store to get a bra and just pick up a 38D. People go and get measured. They figure it out what their back size is, what their cup size is. So <clears throat> we're used to tailoring uh, what we need for our breast health. Uh, and it's time we start thinking about doing that by risk. And that's what the wisdom study is. Women informed to screen depending on measures of risk to integrate risk assessment, screening, and prevention. It's a modern era trial to challenge the notion that everyone should be screened the same. We want to, through this process, improve the identification of women at risk for aggressive inter interval cancers. Are we there yet? We aren't, but this is the path to getting us there. And these are the kinds of trials that will help us get to a better place. And really, there's been an unprecedented advance in science and technology. You know, we have lots of advances in prevention. We have, you know, medicines that actually change the hormonal environment and can reduce the chance of getting a breast cancer. For some particular types of women, that risk reduction can be as high as 85% in women who have atypia. <clears throat> but most people think, oh, I don't want to get the up, I don't want to do that. Where the uptake of these prevention interventions is only like 5% of the people where it really would matter. We have a lot of advances in risk assessment. We know about <clears throat> not just the BRCA1 and 2 genes, but there are nine genes that can confer different levels of risk. And as I said, this polygenic risk is also advanced. We had seven genes that we thought were important, then there were 76, then 200, now 300, and that's gonna continue to increase. <clears throat> and one of the things we do in the wisdom study is, <clears throat> sorry, when we get more information, we continue to incorporate it. And why? And you say, well, why don't you just stick to one risk model? Well, think about it. If you came in to see me last year and you didn't have family history, and then you came and says, gosh, my twin sister got breast cancer three months ago. I wouldn't say, oh, well, I'm sorry. I can't take that into account because I saw you last year and I assessed your risk and you didn't have any family risk. Of course not. We wouldn't say something like that. So we need a trial that has some flexibility that is learning as we learn so that the results are really testing the concept of risk-based screening, not a specific model, because as, the, as our science improves, we want to improve. Another reason people think that genetic testing is bad or concerning is because they think, oh, well, I don't have any legal rights, but that's not true. HIPAA, the Health Information Portability Act says, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, that you don't have, um, that, you, that pre existing conditions, um, you can't be discriminated against and a genetic inherited susceptibility is a pre-existing condition. And as well, there's the GINA Act, which also says you can't be discriminated on the risk, on the basis of risk. And it turns out that people who have the small populations with, with risk for uh, susceptibility to breast cancer are so small that it's not worth it uh, to discriminate against those people uh, from the actuary standpoint. Uh, and then I think, the legal rights, you know, the, there was a, there's the case in the Supreme Court that said, uh, that said that you can't own or patent the genome. And why is that important? Because that really opened it, opened up the testing that allowed the prices to plummet uh, because we brought in um, next generation sequencing. So the cost, not for everyone's test, but for some tests went from $5,000 or $3,000 down to really about $250 or $200, which is the cost of a mammogram. So all of that's completely changed the game. So 
we put that to work and we put that to work by saying well we'll put all of our best foot our best information together into a personalized screening risk assessment and on that basis assign people an age to start you know frequency of screening what kind of modality and when to stop so when to start when to stop and we compare that to what many consider the gold standard which is annual screening starting at 40 and in this, so as I said, these are the, if you are in the personalized arm, <clears throat> you get <clears throat> the one piece of information we need is your, <clears throat> your density from your mammogram. We send you a questionnaire. It is all online. And, you know, if, if, if access to an iPad or a computer or your phone is difficult, you know, you can go into a library or there can be lots of ways that we can spread this. Um, we still, ask lots of questions about your health. And then we actually send this, how do we do this screening? Very simple. A kit comes to your house, you spit into it, you put it back into the little box it came in, stick it back in your mailbox and that's the end of it. And a month later, we send you back your information about what your bucket is and whether you should, um, if you're in your forties and your risk is low, you won't start until age 50. <clears throat> Otherwise it's every other year or every year or every other year alternating with an MRI. And importantly, if you're at high risk, we reach out to you. We have a breast health specialist who will give you a personalized tour of your risk and what you can do to adjust that risk. And then we can give you that information to discuss with your primary care physician. And we also have a consultation service that we're developing so that women who don't have access to people to do additional counseling or treatment, that we can make that available. <clears throat> and all we ask for people is to keep in touch with us, let us know if anything happens, if they get a biopsy, if they get a diagnosis so that we can continue to learn. And every year we just ask you to fill out a screening questionnaire. So it's not hard, but it does require commitment. And that commitment is what helps us learn. And it's the community together, believing that we can do more that's so important. Again, this is, you know, there's still some unexplained risk and we're continuing to work on that. This study will be the basis for a lot of that. There are a bunch of big consortia around the world where people are really working hard to make this lower, but you know, there's about a quarter of people actually have, um, you know, about a quarter of the people who have hereditary risk do have one of these mutations, but more and more people have these combinations of low risk, these polygenic risks, which actually can confer lower risk or higher risk. And there may be, you know, in our next iteration of the trial, maybe 10 to 15% of women have risk that's so low, it doesn't make sense to screen. Whereas another 5% of people might have risk for these very aggressive cancers that might make it much more possible to screen every six months with different technologies. And these kinds of changes, you know, are easily affordable by being thoughtful about who needs what. So how do you participate? You can enroll online, you can do it from your couch, you can do it from, you know, uh, on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer, from a, in a go at a kiosk, in a, in a, in a library. <clears throat> and there's no recruitment uh, center that you have to go to. Uh, and again, it's this annual questionnaire and being willing to follow the recommendations and to keep in touch with us. All the study services are rendered virtually, even the breast health specialist is all telehealth, which, you know, the era post COVID, uh, I think most people now have capability to do that. That's been a silver lining of a very terrible pandemic. Um, and so it's all personal and confidential. And importantly, we know that not everybody wants to be randomized. What does the word randomized mean? And why do we do it? Well, we think that scientifically, sometimes the best way to learn is to give people an assignment that they don't know about, that it's not based on bias. So you're randomly assigning someone to either the personalized arm or the annual arm. And for certain questions, that's the best way to learn. But there are many questions that we can answer just from each group, including what do people prefer? So if you feel strongly about getting an annual mammogram, you can go to the self-selection group and getting that annual screening. And it's important to do that because if you're not gonna follow the recommendation and all you want is annual screening, then that's what you should get. If on the other hand, you say, well, you know, I really like this idea of personalized risk and I want to know that and I'll follow the risk recommendation on that basis, then that's what you should choose.
And if you're not sure, best thing is to be randomized. About 65% of women in the study are doing that. It's, uh, we actually try and explain everything in pretty plain language. So it's easy. You just go to the wisdom website, wisdomstudy.org. Everything is in English and in Spanish. Um, uh, I would say that uh, we're trying to partner with all communities. It is super important for people of all races, all ethnicities to join so that the results that we come up with are actually applicable to everyone. Um, so uh, tell everybody you know uh, to participate uh, of all ages. We say that most women will spend 30 to 35 years of their lives screening. Why not take the next five years, screen with us and help us change the way breast screening and prevention uh, is, is, is conducted in this country. We've had nearly 35,000 women enroll in the study. About uh, 45,000 have actually uh, signed up and uh, we're hoping more of them will continue to join. We've had over 10,000 women learn about their genetic risk for breast cancer. In the next iteration, if this turns out to be true, it might even be that starting at 30 is when you would get that first screen. But we've got to get the first step done in order to get to that point. We've counseled over 1,000 women who are at elevated risk. And we've had more than 200 women develop cancer while they've been on the study. So help us. So we're really so grateful that you have invited us into your network and to ask questions about this. We hope that you will help us promote this and talk about it. If you are really motivated to help us spread the word in a more active way than just telling a few friends, let us know, put your name in the chat. Allison uh, Fiscalini is uh, ready to take your name and you can be an ambassador and help promote it wherever you go. Um, we think that the gift of wisdom is the best kind of gift to give. Uh, and you can't do better unless you know better, uh, in the words of Maya Angelou. So uh, we hope that you will tell everyone you know about the wisdom study and uh, join us. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, take questions. Thank you, Dr. Esselman, for a wonderful presentation. Clearly one size does not fit all and you are addressing that issue. So let's start the Q&A. You can still submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get through all of the submitted questions, but we may not be able to do that due to time constraints. So um, let's get started. Uh, the first question that's been submitted is, should I have additional screening like MRI or ultrasound if I am 70, had a lumpectomy, no node involvement with chemo and radiation with a stage one, grade three, and dense breasts? Just had a mammo one year after surgery. We do ask that you try to keep these things general in nature. Um, so there's a, you know, this is another topic of controversy. This is something that we would say that the, you know, that we, we're, we're very interested in something called wisdom for cancer. And I think you're gonna see a big sea change in the way we think about uh, screening post-cancer. And I think it should include several things. What is your background risk? What are your underlying risk factors, and breast density being one of them? Did you have a mammographically detected cancer to begin with and was it found early? So all of these things have to be taken into account. And I think one of the reasons why screening, I mean, is going to change is because we now know that the PARP inhibitors make a difference, can make a difference in people's outcomes. The Olympia study was reported at ASCO this year. And this looked at women who were BRCA carriers. If they had cancer and they were treated up front with systemic therapy, chemotherapy up front, and they did not achieve a complete response. So the tumor didn't go away with the chemotherapy first. Um, they were randomized to taking a year of PARP inhibitors or not for the following year. And that dropped people's chance of getting breast cancer by 50%. So I think that over this next year, it's gonna be standard to get everybody tested. And I think based on your, the one thing that they're not gonna incorporate is this polygenic risk. But my feeling is um, that we should be doing something similar um, in the world of cancer. And, you know, if you have, if you don't have breast, dense breasts and you, uh, and, and you had a low grade cancer with low risk, you know, screening every other year is probably fine. If you had a very aggressive cancer and you're 
wasn't detected by your uh, uh, mammogram, then it's possible that you do need additional screening. Now there's a big controversy of does the 3D mammography work and should we be thinking about, you know, do we need contrast imaging or is 3D enough, is ultrasound enough? If you really are at risk and you have not just dense breast tissue, but extremely dense breast tissue, that's very different. Half of people have dense breast tissue in the way we call it. There's, you know, A, B, C, D. A is fatty breast, B is scattered fibroglandular densities. That's non-dense. Then there's the term is heterogeneously dense, which means it's patchy density. And then next homogeneously dense or very dense. The whole thing looks like a whiteout. Turns out that only 15% of people have that extreme density. That's really where mammography isn't as good. So you have to know which group you're really in. Do you have a genetic mutation, you know, where your risk might be getting another one? Now, if it's your first cancer and you didn't have one until 70, you may not be as much at high risk and maybe every year is fine, but maybe you're better off with a contrast imaging study. If you have extremely dense breast tissue, it is very clear and you have this high risk, it is very clear that contrast imaging is better than mammograms, but they detect different things. So that's why we say alternating every six months, one's looking for calcifications, the other is looking for, you know, uh, it's looking at very, it's not looking, uh, density doesn't obscure that image. So that's the recommendation. So I can't, of course, give you your personal information. You have to put all those pieces together, but those are the considerations for it. Uh, another question that was sent in, do yearly mammo mammograms from age 40 cause breast cancer? I don't think that's true. A lot of people worry about that. What we know from you know, therapeutic radiation is that the upper window is 35. You know, when the, we know this from the Hodgkin's uh, patients, people at Hodgkin's disease who got mantle radiation, which is like a T-shaped uh, radiation field for all their nodes is very clear that, you know, especially 15 to 35 is that window, and especially like the 15 to 25, it really confers a very high risk. You know, we don't do that anymore, but you know, there's a lot of things that we do that we stop doing because we learn, right? And that's one of them. But that information does tell us that the period of risk for your breast tissue is gosh, around, you know, in that period of time up until you're 35. And it kind of tapers off pretty quickly. So we don't, you know, routine mammography isn't usually considered till 40. And so one of the questions is if, you know, if you have very dense breast tissue and you're a BRCA carrier and you're in your 20s and everyone in your family had early cancer, is mammography helpful? Well, probably not. There, I think an MRI at least once a year or maybe even every six months is something to think about. Um, so the other thing to know is that you get more radiation getting on a plane from San Francisco to Denver than you do from a mammogram. The amount of radiation that's delivered in a mammogram has gone down 10 to 20 fold. Um, so if you go to a, an MQSA approved facility with dedicated uh, mammographers, you will not have uh, a lot of risk or exposure. So that's not really the consideration. Long-winded answer, sorry about that. If someone is BRCA1 positive with uh, metastatic breast cancer, what should her daughter's breast screenings be? Uh, so in the setting of carrying an inherited mutation and you know what is causing that risk in your family, the most important thing to do, of course, is to test your daughters to see if they have it. There's a 50-50 chance that they have it. They may not carry that mutation. So that's very important. If they don't, they don't need screening that's any different from what the average person street is. If you are a mutation carrier, uh, that's different. And then what we usually say is we start screening uh, 10 years before the earliest onset in the family. If you have a very small family, um, we start, you know, probably at, you know, 30 um, with, with screening every six months. So it is something to really think about. I am very hopeful that in the next five years, we will actually be able to have uh, new prevention trials for people who are bracket carriers. Now, the issue about whether or not to consider prophylactic surgery is a very personal one. Uh, and you know there are pros and cons and not everybody chooses to do it. There's no right or wrong here. Uh, but 
I have found that people who come from families where there's you know, a lot of death at early ages, especially uh, despite treatment, that these are the people who are much more motivated to get a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Um, you know, there aren't great, there's not really anything great to prevent um, triple negative breast cancer at the moment, but I have a lot of hope that we're gonna think differently about how to take these PARP inhibitors, which given alone are not that toxic. And it might even be something like a month a year or you know, would be sufficient to just kind of screen out incipient cancers or maybe every six months. These are things that we have to start thinking about. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this study. This is information we know. We can identify these people. We can, once we identify these larger groups of people, which, you know, it's a very uncommon to have a mutation, but when you do population-based study and you find them, you have plenty of people in which you can start testing new approaches. Another thing that we found in the wisdom study, of course, is that, you know, someone who's 55 can find out they're a mutation carrier. And if they come from a really big family and they don't have any cancer in their family, well, we take that into account. And then another thing that's very interesting is all those other genes, those SNPs, that polygenic risk actually does change your risk. So we can make it lower or a lot higher. So there are other tools to help us inform people. BRCA2 is sometimes a little bit different. Sometimes you can, you know, BRCA2 can put you at risk for, or say a mutation like CHECK2, which puts you at risk for slower growing hormone positive tumors. You can take um, endocrine risk reducing strategies and that can dramatically decrease your risk of getting breast cancer. And that, you know, can render the decisions about prophylactic mastectomy very different and might not be very impactful at all. And, you know, the, the benefit is less. Now it's important also to know that of course, if you're a BRCA1 carrier, your risk of ovarian cancer is also increased. So it's about 40%. For BRCA2, that's about 15%. So not as high. And those are usually later in life if you're over 40. But what we usually tell people is if you finish with your childbearing, especially if you're a BRCA1 carrier, that's something you should think about doing. And you can always take hormone replacement, especially in BRCA1 where you're predisposed to triple negative breast cancers. So if you are one of those people, you want to get yourself to a center where there are people who are truly expert who can advise you specifically. Are, are men included in the study? Uh, men are not included in the wisdom study because men do not you know, reach, they don't have a frequency of cancer that justifies population-based screening. Now, a lot of, we, we've had a number of people you know, write to us and say, gosh, that's discriminatory. Why aren't you doing that? You know, in our trials like ice by two or our other vaccine studies, we include men and women because once you have cancer, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. But this is a population-based screening study. You have to have a certain baseline rate of cancer to make it reasonable to screen for cancer. And it turns out that the incidence of cancer is a hundred times higher in women than it is in men. So it's just not common enough to screen. Even someone who's a BRCA2 carrier you know, their lifetime risk in the highest sense is five or 6%, which is below the average risk, which is 12% for the average woman. So they're still in a fairly low risk category. And it also depends, you know, if you have a lot of breast tissue and you're a man and it's hard to do a self-exam, that could be a reason to get a mammogram every year if you are a BRCA2 carrier. But if you're very thin and you have a small chest wall, it might not make, and you can't really get a memory, it doesn't make any sense. You have to individualize those, those, uh, those questions. How early does a mammogram detect cancer? Well, again, early is relative. Early is relative to what? If you have something that's very indolent and slow growing, I mean, it could be there for a long time. And again, we said, we, we actually have identified these ultra low risk cancers. And we actually have a molecular signature for it. It's called mammoprint ultra low. We use the mammoprint signature to test this. And they can be smoldering around or sitting around for a long time and probably not cause very much harm. Um, but it turns out that if you have a very virulent cancer, something that's you know, bound and determined to kill you, it could be lethal when it's as small as a centimeter or a half a centimeter. That's actually, you know, it's not very common, but there is this problem where we have 
Then we know this when we screen for our eye spike cancers that about 5% of the women who screen, not very many, do have metastatic disease at the time of presentation. And some of those women don't have big cancers. So we have to ask ourselves, what is causing that? Why is that? And over the period of time, the last 40 years, that very small rate of presenting with stage four disease has not changed, no matter what we do. So there are some people, very rare, that are at risk for these very virulent cancers. And that is actually the topic. I'm actually working on a grant this week to try and explore that and understand why is that? Can we find those people who are at risk? Is there something we can do to prevent that? So that's, that's again, one of the reasons why we want to do all this work is to change the field. You know, back in 1996, when BRCA1 was cloned and the test actually became available, the first studies came out and then BRCA2 in 1997, people were saying, oh, well, gosh, why would you want to do this? You're just going to, you know, people are going to be freaked out and, 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 you know, you can't help them. Why even find this information out? There was actually a big resistance to this information. But the reason for this is because once you get that information out there, the scientists continue to work on it. You know, people work on developing, you know, strategies. So the whole idea of the PARP inhibitors was a trick, right? To say that we, we, we couldn't figure out how to treat them, but it was like, well, cancers also have weaknesses. So, you know, we're going to harness the weakness so that the DNA repair pathway is already at risk in someone who's a bracket carrier. They can't repair errors in the genes that most they're not as good at it. That's one of the things that causes cancer. So if they just took it out and took out the rest of the pathway, the whole thing would die. That's be what's behind the, the PARP inhibitors. And it's taken 20 years to get that drug to market, but in, in an effective way, long story, lots of reasons for that. But you know, now that it's there, now we can start thinking differently about prevention. So it's important to know these things. You know, It's like scary to think, gosh, I could get a cancer and have it spread by the time I'm diagnosed. It's very uncommon. And if you have a stage one cancer, it's like 2%. It's like really rare. If you have a more aggressive cancer, it's maybe 5%. It's not very common. But if you do have it, we have to have a different strategy. And if there's something we can learn about it to figure out how to change it, then that's good. Why are thermograms not used more since they are more effective than traditional scans? Because they're not effective. It's a very cool idea. And thermograms, you know, this is like the stuff that they do for suitcases when you're looking for bombs and a lot of these things, you know, you can look for cracks, you know, the equipment on, a, on, a, on an airplane, you wanna look for cracks and the thermograms look at heat based studies. And it's a really cool idea but there have been many head-to-head -head trials, old ones. And even like 10 years ago, there was a, with the technology updated, there was a recent one. And how do we know that? Well, in the data, the people who had cancers, there were, it was a 50, 50 chance that the thermograms would find them and the things that the thermograms found 50, 50 chance that it was something or not. So it, unfortunately with the current technology that they, they aren't effective. So you can get them. I would, you know, they're not covered because they're not effective um, and they can have a lot of false positives. It's not going to help you. Might as well take that money and spend it on yourself to do something else. That's my opinion. It uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't keep looking for better technologies. One of the things that I'm actually really excited about is the diffusion weighted imaging of MR, which is, you know, now we have this installed base of MR machines if there was a way to really get this information without adding contrast and people are working on it, um, I think that would be really cool. Because again, it's not looking, you know, you want something that's complementary that's not based on breast density. Ultrasounds and mammograms really depend on, you know, the penetration of a sound wave or an X-ray beam, you know, to see something different. You know, thermograms is trying to look at something different, sort of heat-based, great idea, didn't work, that's okay. Move on to the next thing. Diffusion-weighted imaging has some promise, actually. I, I wouldn't be surprised with if within five years we have something that really works. It could be actually cheaper and easier than a mammogram and doesn't require compression. So I think we have to keep pushing for better technologies, for sure. 
What are your thoughts about the fast MRIs? Um, fast MR is, you know, it's based on the uh, premise, the same premise and the same tools that we've used in MRI all along. I've been involved with MRI uh, with my partner, Nola Hilton, who is a physicist who developed the first sequences for breast MR. And, you know, all it's doing is taking advantage of that rapid rate of rise. Um, I think over the next five years, you're going to see a lot more of that. Most MRs are going to convert to, uh, to, to fast MR, especially for screening. You may need more detail once you've had a cancer to, you know, to get some of that additional detail. We use this detail to look at whether or not you're responding to therapy. Because uh, if you've got a bad cancer, the most important thing to do is not surgery first. Not. I'm a surgeon. I should know. You know, what you want to do is get that information about response to therapy. Um, so we use MRI to characterize that and learn about that. And that's how we've been, you know, systematically advancing the field where, I hope in five years, you know, most people who have these bad cancers will know how to treat them and with what, right? So that's pretty exciting. Um, but uh, these fast MRs mean that you could probably do a scan in about 10 minutes instead of 40 minutes or 45 minutes. The problem with MRI still though is you have to have the IV put in and that takes an X, I mean, it's still an extra study. There's a number of people who are interested in contrast, IV contrast mammography, that use iodinated contrast, but I, that's actually a pretty cool technique. I, I think that that might even have fewer false positives. The hope is that, you know, when you say, well, why not do an MRI for everyone? Well, MRI, everyone doesn't need one, doesn't add value when you don't have particularly dense breast tissue. And there's a high false positive rate. That background enhancement that you see on the screen actually though may be an important risk marker. That's one of the things that we're looking at is how do we manipulate risk um, you know, what's our cholesterol, what's our blood pressure going to be. I think the background enhancement on MRI is going to be one of those. You have to screen high-risk women with MRI anyway. And this is one of the tricks we've been using for DCIS. Um, you know, we've been working on vaccines. We've been working on, you know, using DCIS as an opportunity to test prevention agents. And it turns out that I think a lot of people who get DCIS probably don't need surgery. Um, a lot of people just need prevention interventions, probably at least half. And if you have a really focal risk, then you, you know, then surgery is beneficial. But again, I, I think all standard treatments should be questioned and opportunities to change them improved. And that's what we're doing with wisdom. <laughs> that leads to another question then. What do you think about the Comet study? Um, well, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for the Comet study. Um, Shelly Wong was at the university. She's the PI, the principal investigator. She was at UCSF for a number of years and we share the same passion for changing the way we uh, uh, approach DCIS. Um, and uh, there are, you know, a study in Europe. There are two studies in Europe. There's Shelly's study, the Comet study. We've actually been working on a, a tools to try and figure out how to use MRI better to figure out who needs screening or not. I think it's critical that these studies get, get conducted. If you have the opportunity to participate in that study, great, you should do it. Um, there will be other studies coming up. I hope to have a study looking, using DCIS as a way to test some of the new emerging hormone directed therapies that we hope will be less toxic and more tolerable. I think one of the great advances too is just our understanding that you know five milligrams of tamoxifen in the setting of DCIS is much better tolerated, and hopefully more people will take it because I think that's actually a very important part of hormone positive DCIS. I'm a big fan of using imaging to help guide how you learn and how you can manage. Um, that's um, you know I think all these contributions are going to be critical. If someone has had breast cancer, do you suggest that their daughters become part of the study? I suggest your daughters become part of the study if they're 40 and above, whether you've had breast cancer or not. Everybody, tell everybody. How does this study address overdiagnosis? Well, when you screen less, you have fewer false positives and you have fewer biopsies. And that reduces the chance that you're going to get overdiagnosed with a cancer that maybe is indolent and wasn't appreciated. DCIS can fall into some, not all DCIS, some DCIS really are precursors of cancers. You know, that's so just by dint of doing less screening in people with less baseline risk, 
we, we should cut the false positive rate, you know, for, for screening and callbacks by half. And we should actually, uh, you know, reduce the amount of DCIS that's detected or some of these. And we're actually doing a study where we're trying to profile the tumors that arise to see if we actually make a difference in the detection of the ultra low risk cancers. So we think it will cut that down um, as well. You know, we're promoting this idea of that whenever you are detected, everybody should know the type of cancer they have. Uh, so that that's one of the, you know, knowing the kind of cancer you have will also allow you to tailor therapy and reduce overdiagnosis. If someone has a diagnosis of atypia, can they be part of the study? They can. And in fact, if you have atypia, and especially if you have background risk, uh, you're an excellent candidate for a medication like tamoxifen. And now we know that even lower doses of tamoxifen, you know, if you're premenopausal or aromatase inhibitors, or there are these a number of studies that are coming out to try different approaches. Carol Fabian has a study looking at Duave or basidoxifene. Um, important fact about atypia is especially the setting of atypia in family history, your risk is definitely higher and your benefit from a medication like tamoxifen or anything that's endocrine risk reducing is really big. You drop your risk by three quarters or 85% relatively. Right. So if you have a predicted risk, you know, of uh, 30%, you know, you could drop your risk to like five to six percent by taking five years of, of a medication. And I always say to people, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to take that or I don't want to do this. And yet they're taking a statin you know, to reduce their heart disease risk. But I always say is like you don't don't read the side effects in the bottle. There's nothing that's life threatening about taking one of these medications, really, because I mean, they're approved by the FDA. So the thing is, everyone needs to decide for themselves. Take it for a month. Don't decide to take it long-term or not. Just take it for a month. See how you feel on it. If you have absolutely no side effects, gosh, and you can drop your risk substantially, why would you not do it? Like, it doesn't mean that's the only thing you should do. If you're overweight, you can work on reducing your weight. If you're not getting a lot of exercise, you can increase your exercise. There's, you can change your diet. There's lots of, you can reduce the amount of alcohol that you take, you know, to not have more than, you know, three glasses of wine a week or something in that range if you're drinking. But there are some people who don't have any of those other risk factors and still have risk. You know, it's like, let's put all the tools that we have in the basket, be open and learn about them. That's part of one of what we're trying to do on the study is to try and uh, you know, try and put all that information together and give individualized risk-based counseling for people. And, you know, if there are additional questions that people have and they want to reach out to us, we are always open and happy, you know, I'll call, you know, people on the study who have additional questions after they get risk counseling. Have you been able to get any findings so far? I mean, what, what have you learned so far? Um, well, I think we found that this is certainly feasible to do. We can, you know, we've set up this whole infrastructure. Um, we've learned that, you know, if pe the, of the people who choose, people actually prefer the idea of personalized screening. So um, we know that that was actually one of our big study questions. And we know that people can follow it. And, um, you know, if we get, if we can double our enrollment this year, you know, we can have results in about two years, two, three years, we'll have the results of the study. And, you know, honestly, if it turns out that it's just as safe to do it this way, there's absolutely no reason not to do it in a personalized way. And that will be the path to making big gains and a big sea change, you know, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need lots of help. We need everybody to know about it, raise the profile get people to join um, and just, you know, keep in touch with us if you join and be committed to the study, you know, all, you know, women should band together and support each other and do what we need. This is, you know, the biggest killer for women now. And um, we need to do something different and we all need to band together to make it better. Well, thank you, Dr. Essman, for a very informative program. And thanks to all of you for participating and submitting questions. Please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends and the link will also be in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous. Thank you and bye. And, and again, thank you I just, much. oh, you're so welcome. And I just wanted to say, you know, we're so, 
honor to be here and to talk to you. And if you want us to come back and there's a specific group that wants to hear more, we're happy to talk. Also, if you are interested in being a wisdom ambassador, um, well, Allison, what's the best way for them to let you know? Um, we can, I can share my direct contact information um, uh, either in the q and I guess I don't know if I can do that or um, you can directly just let Deb know and and just just tell Deb or the leadership at Share and they'll pass the names on to us and we'll be happy to contact you. Absolutely, that's great. Well, thanks everyone for attending and spending part of your morning with us. We're really appreciative of your interest. Thanks a lot. Okay, great.